welcome Mr. Pablo Solman. Hey there. So, I'm an inventor, and I want to share a little bit about how we invent where I come from. But first, see if you can find yourself on this chart. So, that's the history of humans on planet Earth. Um, not very many of us until about 160,000 years ago, we got the first Homo sapiens, and then thousands, millions, but it wasn't until the last couple hundred years we hit that hockey stick growth curve and got to billions, almost overnight. So what happened? Well, we solved a bunch of the hard technical problems that kept humans from thriving, right? How do you feed this many people? How do you eradicate the disease that's killing them off? How do you give them jobs and homes? These are problems that we solved by inventing a new technology. It wasn't government policy, it wasn't religion, it wasn't an election or some charity. New technology is why we all exist today. And if there's anything all those extra humans are good for, it's making more problems. So, we have to figure out how are we going to invent new technology and bring it into the world on that scale. So by definition, what worked in the past isn't gonna work. We're doing something new. We're trying to keep a lot more people alive with no additional planets, at least so far. So, um, we wanna try and solve some of the biggest problems in the world. Here's an example. This is Anopheles stefensi. She's a female, mosquito, carrying malaria in sub-Saharan Africa. And this is the most dangerous animal on Earth. She takes almost a million lives a year, half of them kids under five years old. Actually, the person sitting next to you is a close second. Watch out for them. <laughs> it's not snakes, it's not sharks, it's not spiders, it's mosquitoes. This is the low-hanging fruit in global health. And we can save those lives, but we have to try, and we have to go invent ways of going after that problem. Mosquitoes are mysterious. We don't actually understand that much about them. We don't even know how they can fly, really. Their wings are so small. It's not Bernoulli effect. We have to learn about them. So this is a kind of protocol diagram for malaria. It spends some of its life in a human, some of its life in a mosquito. It's very complicated. We don't understand that much about how it works. So what we do in the lab where I work is we try to attack every point in that protocol so that we can invent new technologies, new solutions to go after this problem. We can eradicate malaria once and for all in our lifetime, but we cannot do it by reading the directions. There aren't any. We have to invent. Now, when you're an inventor, you always want to try and invent a solution that uses lasers, because they're super cool. So we thought it would be funny to find these mosquitoes and shoot them down with laser beams. Um, so then, we tried it. We bought some junk on eBay, started writing a little bit of code. Six weeks later, we're tracking bugs. So these are live mosquitoes. We use motion detection algorithms to find moving stuff. We aim a laser at whatever's moving. And then if its wing beat frequency is telling us it's a mosquito, the correct species and the right gender, because only the females carry malaria, then we shoot it down with a lethal laser. Here's what that looks like. <whistles> She's not coming back. Yeah, it's okay, you can laugh. You're allowed to kill as many mosquitoes as you want. Nobody really likes them. Uh, we vaporized her wing off. We ended up using too big of a laser um, at first. So here we just vaporized an entire bug. Um, it's very satisfying work if you can get it, though. <laughs> I don't know what you guys do at your job. All right, 
So this work goes on at the Intellectual Ventures Laboratory. That's where I work. Um, we basically just bought one of every tool in the world, hired one of every kind of scientist, put them all on the same team, and started trying to invent for the biggest problems that we could find. Um, that's kind of a weird business, because with invention, you're going to be wrong almost all the time. We're trying to, I'm trying to invent on a 10-year horizon. I want to be coming up with solutions that make sense to do in the next 10 to 20 years. Well, um, guessing 10 years out is pretty hard. So we solve that by doing it at a very large scale. So I want to show you some of the things we've been in. So hurricanes are fueled by heat irradiating off the surface of the ocean. So we thought if we could cool off the surface of the ocean, the hurricanes might not be so bad. So this is the simplest invention we ever came up with. It's a giant tube you stick in the ocean vertically. Waves push hot water into the top. You got free energy, waves. That creates a hydraulic head and pumps the hot water down where it mixes up with cold water below. There's cold water everywhere in the ocean, just not on top. <laughs> and so then that cycling brings the surface temperature down by one or two degrees. You put a thousand of these things out every kilometer, you put one out, and it brings down surface temperature by one or two degrees, enough to make your Cat 5 hurricanes into Cat 4 or Cat 3, right? Now, this is a big project, but it's like millions of dollars, not billions. It costs a lot less than the damage from a hurricane. We might need ideas like this to buy us some time while we figure out how we're gonna keep atmospheric warming from making things worse. Here's another idea for reversing some of the effects of global warming, at least temporarily, while we figure out what we're gonna do about getting off of carbon emitting fuels. Now, plan A is stop polluting the environment, okay? Plan B is also probably stop polluting the environment. Somewhere around plan D, you might need to buy some time. So this idea is simple. It's a hose, 20 kilometers up. The triangular thing is a helium balloon that holds the hose up. And then you pump sulfur dioxide up there and aerosolize it. Just a little white particle reflecting like 1% of sunlight. And that's enough. One of these hoses, we think, is enough to bring down Earth's atmosphere one or two degrees, enough that you could restore Arctic ice caps to pre-industrial levels, right? Again, doesn't solve the problems, but it might buy us 50 or 60 years to switch off of burning coal and gas. This stuff's pretty interesting. If you had a soup can full of depleted uranium, there's enough energy in there that it's equivalent to $12 million of gas at the pump. So much energy in uranium, but it's radioactive and dangerous and we make a lot of nuclear waste and stockpile it and save it for our grandkids because we don't know what to do with it. Well, what a lot of people don't realize is today's reactors were designed before you were born with pencils and slide rules. And they're only 0.7% efficient. For most of our lives, nobody's been trying to invent new reactor technology. Well, we invented a new type of reactor that's powered by nuclear waste. So instead of mining uranium, we just take the stuff from the stockpile, put it in our reactor, it gets enriched and burned inside the reactor. You light it up at one end with a little bit of fissionable fuel. That leading wave enriches the fuel. The second wave burns it. There's never a critical mass of fissionable fuel in there. It can't melt down like Chernobyl or something like that. It burns from one end to the other in the, over the course of 60 years in this design. It's a modern, safe reactor design. We design it with a giant supercomputer where we model all the neutrons in the reactor core. We know how to engineer a better reactor now than what we were able to do with today's reactors. But we gotta try. Today's reactor is 0.7% efficient. Ours get the rest of that energy out. This is a stockpile in the United States. 700,000 metric tons of depleted uranium left over 
from today's reactors and making bombs. With this one stockpile in our reactors, we estimate we can power the entire planet, including growth, for about the next thousand years. We don't even need to dig up more uranium. We can do better, but we gotta try. We have to invent the technologies that are gonna carry us into the future. Um, we're actually working on trying to build the first reactor like this in the next few years here in China, All right? We do these projects with Bill Gates. He's chairman of that company. I've never shown this before, but because we're talking about energy a lot, I wanted to show you another project we have going in the lab. So for the, the way we make most electricity, we burn something, make a lot of heat, and then use the heat to heat up water, run a steam turbine, which runs a generator and spits out electrons. Um, most of that ends up being like less than 50% efficient. But it also doesn't scale down very well. You can make a smaller steam turbine, but it doesn't get cheaper. So most of our power plants are really big. So we've been imagining for as long as we used electricity, uh, could we come up with a more efficient way of going from heat to electricity? Well, um, that's what Stirling engines or Peltier junctions are, but they tend to only be a few percent efficient. They don't work very well. So we invented this new material using nanofabrication techniques from the semiconductor industry. So made kind of like a computer chip. But you heat this thing up and it spits out electrons. And it works at any scale. You can see that's the size of a coin. So you could burn natural gas at home and make electricity, or run it over a campfire, or you can run it over a coal plant. Works at any scale. And we're gonna be able to beat the efficiency of steam turbines. There's all kinds of amazing new technologies out there. A lot of times people get confused because we use the word technology so much to refer to things like iPhone apps. <laughs> and it's different, right? Those, just because there's a computer in it doesn't mean it's technology. We have to invent new technologies that can actually change the world. This woman is packing $25,000 worth of vaccines into a t little styrofoam cooler. And she's gonna truck them out into rural Africa, start injecting kids, and half of those vaccinations are gonna fail. A quarter million kids a year are gonna die of something they were vaccinated against. And the reason is the vaccines didn't stay cold. They didn't stay cold enough long enough. There's no detection for that, so we just inject kids anyway. These are places where there's no reliable refrigeration. You know, most of us don't have that problem. Um, but we have to try and invent some way of solving these problems, right? Um, we invented this thing. It's a kind of super thermos. You put vaccines in there, stick it in the sunshine, with no external power, there's no power cord, come back a couple months later and your vaccines will still be cold. This is not science fiction, these things are real. It's that, in fact, this one's manufactured here in China by Akma, right? And we're using it in the developing world. This is literally the deployment scenario. You strap this thing to a camel, walk for days out into <laughs> some place in Ethiopia with no roads, set up a clinic under a tree and start injecting kids. That's the front lines of vaccination. This is how we eliminate infectious disease. But this is not the kind of problem that we have. It's not a problem I have. My kid's vaccinated. I got refrigeration and consistent power. To solve these problems, we have to go to these places and find problems that we don't have and solve a problem that a billion people have. And it's harder, but it's more important, right? Just because we've invented a new technology and figured out how to make our product for rich people doesn't mean we're done. We've only begun. There's still a lot of work to do to figure out which of those technologies are useful. Can we adapt them and take them out and solve a bigger problem in the world, right? That's the current state-of-the-art cooler. It's only good for four hours. We get two months. 
Um, the way satellite communications work, you've got satellites up in the sky, and then like on a boat like that, for example, you've got that dome. Inside the dome is a dish. And the dish is mechanically gimbaled so it can steer and aim at the satellite. This is a, a military drone from the US. Same thing. St there's a physically steered dish in there because that's the only way you can aim it, aim a beam at the satellite to get it online. Well, we've been working in this new area in science for a little while called metamaterials. Now, these are materials that don't exist in nature, but we can manufacture them and they give us some cool new superpowers. Well, the first thing we invented was this new type of antenna. Um, it's a flat panel, has no moving parts, but it can electronically steer a beam, a holographic beam that's formed off the surface. So you can put it on a car, a boat, a plane, a train, whatever, and it will just find satellites and talk to them. We have these things in cars. They drive coast to coast across America, streaming 4K video, uncompressed, both ways, off of satellites. Right? Nobody else knows how to do that. Every satellite we put up these days has more wireless capacity than the entire satellite network had a few years ago. It's a massive amount of capacity, but you can only talk to it by steering a dish. We can improve a lot of things. We adapted this technology to make a low power radar. So it's not much bigger than a cell phone. Normal radars are very large, require a lot of power. This one, you can stick it on a drone and it can see a barbed wire fence miles away for collision avoidance. You can put it on a car and do collision avoidance and get rid of the spinning laser that Google uses, right? I could also take that antenna and put it on the side of a building and aim a separate beam at each user for cellular, reuse the spectrum. This is a way to get gigabit wireless to everyone on Earth, right? See if you can find yourself on this chart. You're probably in one of the more lit up spots. Actually, look at China. There's a lot of places left. This is where internet is. We have a lot of people we still gotta get internet to. And we can't afford to do it by digging up the roads and laying down fiber optic cable the way we always do it. We need to reinvent how we do those things. So I wanted to show you these things as a way of showing you, like, we have all kinds of new technologies that are coming. Where I come from, we're like, um, <laughs> you know, want to be friends on WeChat? <laughs> um, I just got to China, I don't have any friends, so sign me up. Um, we're inventing these new technologies because we think that's what matters. We invent a new technology, we bring it into the world, to change the world and make it better. And that's what I'm hoping you will all help join me in figuring out how to do. China is an amazing country with a promising future. You guys can be better at this than we are, right? The potential here is huge. You can, do, you can learn from what we did and figure out how to do it better. And this can be where new technologies come into the world. And I will join you. I'm trying to save the world, not just America. So let's get on it. Thank you.